My name is Mary McFadden, and I'll be hosting the webinars. I am the coordinator for the Northern Rockies Fire Science Network. I'd like to start off by telling you that the Fire Science Network is a partnership supported by the Joint Fire Science Program. Our goal is to facilitate knowledge exchange to improve fire and fuels management. We do this through a variety of activities from hosting workshops, field trips, and webinars to developing literature syntheses. Our four-part webinar discussion series is based on this U.S. Forest Service Rocky Mountain Research Station publication by Terry Jane et al. The webinars cover four topics focusing on fuel management practices. The topics are dry forest ecology, prescribed fire, wildlife, and economics, and these occur over the, you know, once a month for the next four months on Wednesdays at this time. Today's discussion on the ecology of dry mixed conifer forests will be led by three authors of the publication who are research foresters with the Rocky Mountain Research Station. Terry Jane and Russ Graham are based in Moscow, Idaho, and Mike Pataglia is in Fort Collins, Colorado. The webinar format cons consists of several topic sections. To get feedback on the topics, Terry, Mike, and Russ have prepared lots of polls and questions for you. At the end of each section, with your help, they'll summarize key points and ideas. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, first of all, I would like to thank you all for basically setting a time in your busy schedules to listen in and hopefully uh, with a little uh, potential uh, subtle prodding, we can get into some discussions and to kind of enhance the product that we produce. Uh, as Mary said, this was actually uh, partially funded by Joint Fire Sciences, and it's really one of the things we did as a team, and the team members are on the screen right now with myself, Russ, but also Hans Dupont, who is really uh, an expert in harvesting systems. Christopher Keyes is uh, another silviculturist researcher out of University of Montana. Jeremy Freed works for the Pacific Northwest Research Station. He's uh, more of an economist. And then Jonathan Sandquist is my right-hand person. He's my support person. And he was actually the one that wrote most of the chapter two of, of the synthesis. And so this is the team. We had a, a, a lot of discussions, and we had a lot more of a, more of a breadth of what we wanted to do. And so this, this goal of this uh, webinar series is to go beyond the document, to give you guys uh, some feel of the concepts and the thought processes that the team went through, for you to give an opportunity to answer, ask questions or clarify some things, those kind of things. So this is kind of like that, you know, instead of just giving a publication and being quiet, we're allowing an opportunity to enhance the information coming from this through these kind of webinar series. So with that, um, we have our first kind of poll. And so that we understand who we're speaking to, we have a couple of questions. So we're going to give a, just a couple minutes for you to fill in that poll a little bit and give us an indication of what, who you are, those kind of things. Yeah, we're starting with the poll, um, how many other people are listening to the webinar with you. So we'll just take about 10 seconds and I can, We'll share the results in a second after we get a uh, high percentage of the voting in. Uh, part of the reason we want to do this is uh, every day we have to show the relevance of this work, and it's kind of nice to get some feedback about the effectiveness of what we're doing and what we're providing you. And so many times we'll have these webinars and we only have one name, and so it's kind of nice to know if there's going to be more than one person sitting with you listening in, or is it you know, just you on the phone itself. All right, I'm going to close the poll and I'll share the results with you, Terry, and the audience. The other thing about these uh, webinars, it's you know we have a we have an audience out there, and as any performer knows, to know your audience and it's tough to look at somebody to see if they're uh, excited, they're tired, or ignored, or whatever. So this gives us a little bit about feedback to who we're presenting to, and uh, 
give us a better feeling of how we can tailor these in the future. Oh, uh, according to the webinar, as far as the poll, there's several of you quietly sitting alone in your office sipping coffee or maybe working right out of home with your pajamas still on. So, so that's kind of neat to know. I think these are kind of interesting to find out because uh, they give us an indication of how many people really are listening into it and how useful this information is. Uh, Terry, somebody made a yeah. Someone made a comment. I, probably the quote we could have re we could have wrote the question a little bit clearer. It says, "How many others?" So assuming that if you have one, that means one other. But I think it was all in the wording. Anyways, we have a good idea of not many people are carpooling today. So <laughs> all right, and now I'm going to start the second question. And here we're just asking, what is your discipline? Again, I, a lot of you guys probably wear many hats, but if you could just select um, the one, your primary work responsibilities, which category they fall under. And the the importance of this is that when we we went through this process and our team argued and conjoled and talked to each other, well, we wanted to sure make this synthesis, this guide for field treatments as sort of a comprehensive guide, but also uh, applicable to many disciplines. And what we wanted to do also was make sure that we could cover enough topics to give a common base of knowledge across a lot of disciplines. So that was one of our goals is that we would have a a common base for a lot of disciplines to discuss fuel treatments uh, and how the different fuel treatments might affect uh, other resources. So that is one of the reasons to, to look across to the disciplines that we have and hopefully the document and our work are reaching these multiple disciplines. Okay, Mary, you're going to have to help me read these. They're a little blurry on my screen, but I can see the bars. There's quite a people in vegetation management, uh, fire, but the wildlife managers are calling in, as well as several researchers. And, and I'm seeing nicely some administrators, some of those decision makers at the very top. So there's a wide breadth of, of individuals coming in. In fact, vegetation management, 67% of the people are calling in. So that kind of gives us a guideline as to uh, who we're t speaking to so that we can kind of direct the seminar uh, kind of towards those directions, and it seems like it's quite broad in breadth. So, hey, Mary, last one. And one of the things that when we talked about these dry mixed conifer forests, uh, as we went through the process, and again, like saying that how we set this up, it became very aware to us that these are very complex, and they cover a large area of the of the northwest and western United States, and even we could even go into Canada and other places. So they are very complex. They cover a large area. And so that there is a lot of different meanings of what a dry mixed conifer forest would be. And as we go through it, it is a transition stage between the dry forest and the real moist forest. And it's a very complex and intermingled. So try, you know, one of the things that we want to do is get feedback of how well we define this and the understanding of people would have of the dry mixed conifer forest. Okay, we have the results from that last poll. Once we, we get a nice normal distribution here. We have a uh, poll and matures. There's quite a bit of uh, well-established uh, knowledge in this thing. In dry mix conifer forests, I look forward to getting comments from you as far as how we captured uh, the ecology of these forests. Uh, very nice. Uh, and I'm glad that some people that are not real knowledgeable about this are calling in. I think that's really important. One of the things that came out when we were doing this is 
we are getting less and less source of mentoring. We're losing our people before they can train the young ones or the new people coming in. And so mentoring was a major element that came through on this particular fuel synthesis. Well, thank you, Mary. Let's, uh, this gives us a feel of, of kind of the information that we're going to be presenting. So let's start with this. First of all, one of the things that we wanted was no excuses. So in that context, we have pro provided a variety of avenues for you to access this document. It is on hard copy, and you can send a message to our library at, at RMRS to be able to access a hard copy. We have CDs, and those CDs have not only the document, but every publication that is cited in there that we could access as PDF. So you would actually have an electronic copy of the references that we do. We also have this online at the Tree Search or at the Rocky Mountain Research Station. And in that, one of the things that the managers always wanted it was access to the science itself. So we created an interactive literature list where you can click on that, click on the reference, and it will take you to that PDF. So this kind of shortens the time, that kind of thing. And the other thing that this thing does is it provides uh, a variety of other uses besides just doing a document itself, a synthesis. The goal and the purpose is really to kind of guide the synthesis of what it contained based on what managers needed. And to do that, we did a series of interviews to access or to define the key areas that we were going to cover. And then we went to what we call the science literature. And this is really the relevant literature. This is not a literature review document. It's really focusing on the relevant literature that was brought up in the questions from the manager input. And from that, we created this really comprehensive fuel management guide. And so for today, we're going to actually focus only on chapters two through four, the ecological section. And the reason we're going to do that is that, as Russ mentioned earlier, it's quite complex. And we soon learned out that when the managers asked, well, what is the dry mix conifer forest supposed to look like, we were unable to really answer that. So today we're going to really focus on expanding what we said in those two, three chapters, but also kind of give a little bit more input and, and that kind of information and provide you in the field to ask some questions, maybe do a little bit of cross-fertilization, uh, you know, taking those mature trees and, and uh, kind of educating the seedlings and saplings, so to speak. So we're going to this particular presentation or synthesis is going to be covering four areas. What are dry mix conifer forests? Where do they occur? What makes them unique? And we're going to finish with challenges and opportunities. So our first poll question, in your opinion, what makes a particular forest dry mix conifer? Are there some key elements that we're thinking about? Uh, you know, one of the things that we as a team struggled with was what is a dry mix conifer? And often it took us quite a few discussions, some interactions, some, um, I could say bluntly, a few arguments as far as what is it? And, and it was an education for the team as well as trying to define that. And as we conducted the interviews across the synthesis area in which we were responsible for, there was different answers depending on people's perspectives. Uh, but all of them agree that they were more complex than, say, a ponderosa pine climax forest, but to what degree that complexity and the ability to implement fuel treatments was, was really highly variable across the area that we, that we worked in. So uh, this is just a quick poll. We just want to kind of get an idea of where people think uh, the dry mix conifer forests are. You know, does it have to have ponderosa pine? Uh, what is the dry mix conifer forest like in your area? You know, because what we define and how people think about this from their perspective may be very different. And so we wanted to see how each of those kind of, how well we captured uh, people's ideas and concepts of what the dry mix conifer forests are. One of the, one of the things that also this is only one of the guides or the projects or products that Joint Fire Science has funded for fuel treatments uh, across the western United States or across the United States. 
so again, we wanted to make sure that we were complementary and additive to a lot of these other efforts. And again, by defining the mixed uh, dry conifer forest, we hopefully we we overlapped in some places and were additive and complementary to a lot of these other efforts, so that we would have by the time Joint Fire Sciences got through with this uh, this projects, that we would have a very good comprehensive guide for fuel treatments across the United States, and also more importantly that. All of these, the guides that were produced by Joint Fire Sciences, the, the concepts and the ideas uh, work across a lot of these guides as well as within them. Okay, Mary, let's close the poll and see what we have. Wow. Well, based on our results, 67% uh, of those who are listening believe it has to have ponderosa pine. 16% uh, thinks that it covers one large continuous landscape. 76% uh, believe it's intermixed with other forest types. 25% believe that our shrubs are a major element of the understory. And 5% primarily occurs within the wildland inter in urban interface. Well, that's an interesting answer as far as occurring within the ur wildland urban interface. So, so based on this, uh, that the dry mix conifer are far more broader than what we consider to be uh, what I almost thought it sometimes would be primarily in that wooey area. So bottom line, when we started to look at this, we just first learned that it was just really not an easy question to answer. But we did find out what they are not. And first of all, they do not have a specific elevation range. In other words, it's not always 25 to 3,500 feet. Uh, it varies depending on where you're at. It depends where you are in longitude and latitude. It depends on your moisture regimes, those kind of things. It doesn't have a specific aspect. It's not always on south-facing aspect. It, for us, it doesn't represent one homogeneous forest type, similar to many, many thousands of acres of dry mixed conifer forests that are continuous. Although. In our, in our poll, many people probably have that scenario. Or are they, or is it just at that border between the true dry Climax ponderosa pine forest versus this mixed conifer forest? And we also found out that it doesn't occur on any one soil type. So there isn't any one general answer about where or what makes a dry mixed conifer forest a dry mixed conifer forest, so to speak. But we did find out, as many of you suggested, that it is diverse in vegetation, that it has several different species. And in fact, probably the key is dry mixed conifer, which illustrates that you at least have two conifer species or two species in there. Like in Utah, it could be aspen or, or ponderosa pine combined. The other thing we found is that it doesn't necessarily have to have ponderosa pine as a potential tree species on it. And, and a case of point is around the country around Salmon Chalice. We don't have hunter of the pine. It goes right to Douglas fir. And so in those, they are still a mixed conifer. They're still kind of, uh, they're still on the dry end, but they just don't have hunter of the pine in them. But that doesn't diminish the fact that they still function kind of like a dry mixed conifer. The other place is probably Northern California with sugar pine. Yeah, some places have hunter of the pine, but a lot of it's dominated by sugar pine. And so from that perspective, we found that, that, that there's a variety of other species in there. And the more productive a stand or forest you have, the more number of species you have in that particular mixed conifer. The other thing is an anomaly is we threw in western red cedar. And the reason we did that is one of the comments in the poll was that they are inter intermixed with other forest types. And in the northern Rocky Mountains, that is particularly true. And what we find out in kind of in relevance to our part of the country is that when the soils become shallow, become a little bit more rocky, that's when the dry mix conifer forest comes in. But any kind of soil depth or any kind of dissected slopes in those slopes or those deeper areas is where cedar will pop out or are more productive or wetter forest types. And so the reason we kind of threw that in is to provide people a thought that when you do fuel treatments in a dry mix conifer forest or you're looking at it, it is not just this one forest type, that it has other little intrusions 
of the sweater type, or it may actually intrude into a more dominant wet kind of type or a drier type. So it's really more of a topographically driven kind of scenario. Uh, and, and it'll vary as cross based on what you have. And maybe in some places it's much more homogeneous, more consistent across the slope. But oftentimes what we discovered through our evaluations is that it is a, it's a mixture. And as I mentioned, typically it's in topographically diverse systems. And here's an example from Dabemeyer. And if you notice that we have like the upland western red cedar intermingling in those draws into where there's maybe deeper soils. And as we go down in elevation, maybe that's when it turns around to be ponderosa pine, Douglas fir primarily, dominating by ponderosa pine mostly. But then there's a slope change or there's a little bit of a steeper area and Doug fir will pop out. And so from that perspective, there's just a real diversity of species out there. And it's not so simple as just this one homogeneous landscape of, of just one type. The other thing that we have particularly is that it's very, very productive. And it shifts between a grass-dominated system and a shrub-dominated system. And then depending on where you're at, depending on the soil, depending on the topography, you can have one or the other or both. Uh, case in point, in Boise Basin, on the Boise National Forest, I will have a grass dominated on the ridge and the southern kind of facing slopes, and then I kick into the more of the northerly or easterly facing slopes, and I get a very much a strong shrub uh, response. So it's, it's not that simple as far as having one forest cover type or understory. It can look like this, where you have a, a fairly easy type of rolling topography that can be easily managed. It has lots of opportunities from a mechanically, uh, being able to treat it mechanically, being able to treat it with fire, being able to treat it a variety of ways. But it can also occur on very steep slopes, where it makes it much more difficult to, to treat real readily. And the biggest thing is that the longevity of your field treatments may be very short-lived because of that productivity, particularly in the shrub-dominated systems. And here is Boise Basin. It was burned nine years ago, and this is what we have today. And we're in fact going to be putting more fire into this right this coming fall or spring to kind of maintain it. So, so the treatment return interval may be very much more rapid than in some other places because of the productivity, because of this potential shrub response. So as we started to basically define this, for the synthesis area that we were assigned to do from Joint Fire Sciences, we had to find a consistent way to describe it. And the only one that we really had across all these different regions, we were doing regions one, two, six, and five, and four, uh, we had to find something consistent. So we ended up using land fire, and we used the biophysical setting model. And so that was really in chapter two. And we came to the conclusion of identifying these series of biophysical settings. Now, in our review process from many of you, and thank you for conducting those reviews and interviews, uh, a lot of you said that, well, we don't use land fire. We are, uh, it's not something that we commonly use. We're not really uh, adjusted to use that. So can you use something else? Well, yes and no where we were able to identify a simple crosswalk. Uh, the Blue Mountains was one, a case in point. Uh, Region 1 was another case in point, where they had an established crosswalks between land fire and uh, their own. We were able to do it. Otherwise, we were not able to. So in the, there's one sentence in the, uh, in the introduction of Chapter 2 that says, don't focus on the land fire name or the land fire number. Please read the description of what it is, because that might tell you which forest type that may belong to you as far as that's concerned. And another reason we used it is because there's some successional pathways, some, some other information that's embedded behind the land fire knowledge. Even though it might be expert knowledge, it gives you some more insight as to what may happen. And so the goal of that, that chapter two was to kind of start giving you some thoughts and ideas about what this thing consists of. And in each of those table, uh, chat, in that chapter, we have tables that kind of go through each one of these in the different regions 
or subregions so that you can get some idea. And so that the idea is to get in a table with all your people that you work with and talk about, well, what is DryMix Conifer for us? What do they consist of? Those kind of things. So, so the big goal of Chapter 2 was to give you the background information to have those discussions. One of the, the back to the, the land fire and the biophysical, uh, a lot of us in the West, we use habitat types, potential vegetation, and like Terry said, this gives us a lot of information. And one of the things that, back to Silviculture 101, uh, habitat types give us a lot of interpretive value on plant succession, uh, the establishment of conifers, establishment of shrubs that that we as silvicultures have used for years, we called it site preparation. And by using these biophysical settings also gives us at least an understanding of the different vegetation complexes that we have in this entire area. And back to, Terry was talking about the interviews very quickly. When we got down into uh, Northern California, Southern Oregon, the shrub complexes uh, turned into maybe flammable shrub complexes that increased fire uh, uh, severity or uh, fire behavior with their presence. In contrast, that some of maybe the shrub complexes in the northern Rocky Mountains, they were actually heat sinks. Some of the Douglas fir, the Menzesia types, were heat sinks with a fire. So this gives us some interpretation so that we don't have this broad scale uh, interpretation across this entire large area that these biophysical settings, these potential natural vegetation groupings give us. So what also, the one thing that we wanted to do with the assessment uh, through the synthesis was provide information for all disciplines, whether it's ecologists, wildlife biologists, silviculturists, uh, that they would have a common grounding or a common understanding of what the uh, vegetation that they were dealing with when designing a fuel treatment. So again, like Terry said, don't, don't look at the, the classification or how accurate it was, but very good, look at it for a discussion point of what we are managing when we're looking at fuel treatments across this broad spectrum. And also by dividing it up within different areas of the synthesis area uh, that you can just pull out those parts and parcels that you might find applicability. Now, what really is neat about the, the product that we have produced, then you can click, like Terry said at the beginning, of some of this interactive literature and give you a further understanding of some of those vegetation complexes. And I think that I was going to add to it there's like in the back of in the document, there's like 20 pages of literature uh, in the document that's interactive for you. And this biophysical settings is probably some of the richest information that we have in the document. So one of the things we noticed in the poll is that a lot of the lands that you mentioned is not in the wildland urban interface. So where do the mixed dry conifer forests occur? In this particular picture, this is along the Kootenai River in, in northwest Montana. And this is probably in, uh, the, north, the dry mist conifer forest tend to occur on the more the southerly facing aspects or in the southerly areas. So that was kind of the questions that we had is like, where do the mixed conifer forests occur? So one of the things that we're doing a little different in this particular uh, webinar is that we're going to have some summary pages. And, and part of this is an opportunity for people to chime in as far as uh, what other elements or how can we summarize the dry mix conifer? What is it made of? Are there any new things that we didn't cover that we just presented to you or didn't cover in the particular synthesis that might be appropriate or, or another piece of information that that might help uh, describe these a little bit better or to be able to think of them in a unique or different way. So kind of we're opening it up a little bit for about, oh, not very long, a couple minutes to kind of summarize this. And one of the things that 
really we started this out, and Terry mentioned it earlier, that the forest types that we're dealing with in this mixed conifer uh, had to have the potential to have ponderosa pine. And this potential then could have went from the really moist western red cedar types up in northern Idaho to the more dry mixed aspen uh, ponderosa pine types in the Black Hills. But they always had to have the potential. And so these back to these successional pathways can get very complex, but they always had ponderosa pine would have the potential. But then as you go into the Blue Mountains or some of Idaho, the Grand Fur complexes in California, the White Fur complexes, uh, mixed with a whole suite of species. So again, as back to the silvix and the vegetation, of how these respond to fuel treatments, how they respond to disturbances, how they respond to fire, are all parts of the synthesis that we tried to put together. So Mary, are you getting any information um, from Yeah, the well, board? we'd like to ask people to submit you know, their input for the summary. We also have a question. I'm going to go ahead and um, let George ask this question via phone, because he's had his hand raised for a while. So. Um, George, I'm going to unmute you, and perhaps you could ask your question if you can hear us. George, are you there? I guess not. Okay, so much for that. Um, folks, yeah, please submit um, your ideas. Either you can raise your hand to ask a question or to make a comment by phone, or you can submit using the um, questions pod. So, yeah, nothing's yeah, coming in right now. I will let, let you know if somebody um, has some comments. Okay. Well, we'll continue on as far as uh, uh, continuing on with the seminar. So, we just kind of described what we think dry mix conifer forests are, but what makes them unique? What is it possibly disturbance that might make them a little bit more unique than, say, the Ponderosa Pine Climax with very dry for us? Uh, so we have another poll question. Hey, Terry. Um, Terry, this is Mary. We do have a couple of questions. So I'm just going to go ahead and let these people ask their questions. Okay. Is that okay? okay. Yes. All right. David, David, are you on the line? This is Dave Powell. Hey, Dave. Hey, Dave. Hi, how are you? Good. Uh, I just had a, a real quick uh, question concerning the distinction or your thoughts about the distinction between dry and moist mixed conifer forests. We have, it uh, seems like here in the Blue Mountains, we have a lot of consensus and a lot of agreement in terms of stakeholders and publics and our collaborative groups about doing active management work in dry forests, but there's a lot of controversy concerning moist mixed conifer forests. And I think Russ probably touched on this a few minutes ago when he mentioned that, that maybe the, the primary factor we ought to think about in terms of drawing that line between dry and moist is the presence of ponderosa pine or the capability, not necessarily the presence, but probably more the capability of that mixed conifer site to support ponderosa pine at some level. So I just want to know if you if you had some thoughts about that because once because once again the dry is is fairly straightforward. It's not that we don't can't learn some more about dry of course. Uh, in fact that's what we're doing this morning, but the moist is extremely con controversial and I I just wanted your thoughts if you had some about how we ought to draw draw the line between that dry and that moist. Well, you know, Dave, I, you know, that was what we started this out, uh, that, you know, the dry was really identified that had the potential to grow ponderosa pine. Now, what you have in the Blue Mountains and we have in a lot of other areas, we have another early cereal species that intermixes it, and that's western larch. And right. what I would suggest to you is um, 
if it has a potential to grow ponderosa pine, it could be classified dry mixed conifer. But as soon as I say that, the uh, when we have the western larch potential growing there, uh, it can grow into some of the moist, you know, western white pine, western hemlock forest, which was has some of the similar characteristics as the dry mixed conifers. And I, as I told you when we started out, there is some overlap between these. And so again, when you grade in from the real dry ponderosa pine to the more moist dry ponderosa pine, for example, in the beautiful Black Hills, when you get on to the oak, uh, the oak habitat types in the northern Black Hills, they even can grade into having some limber pine and even some dug fir potential in some of those areas. So again, Terry had that very good slide of how this thing can be very mixed and intermingled. And so again, you know, really defining it as a dry mixed conifer or a moist mixed conifer, it can be very intermingled, especially in some of this broken topography like, Dave, you have in the Blue Mountains. Yeah, and so I think, you know, to answer your question is that it's not as clean, uh, the, the convergence between the dry and the moist is not very clean. And so it, you cannot, to me, manage fuels uh, isolate it to the dry because you can flip over an aspect and you're in the moist. Or you can get into a little deeper uh, basin or bench and then you're in the moist again. So so I look at it as you have to manage the transition as well. And so that might open some doors as far as uh, getting more into the moist forest. It's, a, it's just not the straight line. It, it's intermingled with the dry mix conifer forest. And you can't just isolate one and, and, uh, from the other. They, they are pair and parcel to each other. Mary, you have another question? Yeah, um, I will take one more. I'll read one, actually, and then, and then we can move forward. This is from Jim. Would you characterize dry mixed conifer as having frequent or relatively frequent fire regimes? Well, you know, that's a perfect question because we're going to be getting to that later in, the, in, in this seminar. We're going to have a really good discussion about what fire regime uh, the mixed dry conifer have. So we'll hold off that question for a few more minutes and then we'll really focus on trying to address it. All right. How about we continue with the poll and then we can catch up on these questions toward the end. Okay. I, I, I went backwards. That's okay. Here we go. So the question is, are there other prevalent disturbances other than fire within the dry mixed conifer forest? And I guess I would add to that very, in that thought process, we'll get to it. Humans, and we talked about it earlier in this, or we, in one of our earlier poll questions, the urban interface was a high concern or whatever of the dry mixed conifers. And again, we as humans have really probably occupied uh, these dry mixed conifers uh, as much if not more than some of the totally dry ponderous pine systems. There's even some meteorites that we've had, but everybody agrees there are lots of other things going on in the dry mix conifer, including weather, disease, and insects. And I tend to agree with everyone. In fact, what we found is that there's a whole bunch of other disturbances occurring in the dry mix conifer forest, as well as in the moist mix conifer forest. So this is not unique to just the dry. We have insects, we have disease we have what we call storms. And these are usually ice storms or wind storms, uh, diverse fire weather outcomes. We have a variety of weather patterns that come in and go and change that. And then we have a lot of different vegetation that I, due to these variety of disturbances that occur here, have evolved to be either resilient to those disturbances or not so resilient to those disturbances. And so in reality, we do have quite a bit of other things that create these for us and how they 
basically create a fuel dynamic, both spatially and temporally, that really start to play into that fire regime question that was asked earlier. And so one of the keys is mistletoe. And this really hit home during the Bitterroot fires of 2000. Uh, the Bitterroot itself had quite a bit of Douglas fir mistletoe. And when it burned, I mean, it would have made great uh, yard furniture because they were only about 20 feet tall and there was these big cages of stems, similar to the Ponderosa pine one on the left, lower left that you see. Uh, and you know what's interesting about mistletoe is that we have this, this in here. The only way you can really remove it is through harvesting and getting it out of the system. But we have little to no information on the fire behavior of these. We have our intuitive knowledge of what fire behavior it is, but we really don't know what would happen if, if we had a fire in here. The disadvantage to some of these these mistletoe heavy areas is that they're difficult to harvest because the value is not there, particularly when it gets as, as ugly as these ones are. And so it's real difficult to treat them and actually be able to pay for the treatment. So they do offer a different challenge, a different fuel dynamic that we know nothing about as far as fire behavior. We have some inferences or maybe some anecdotal evidence. One of the interesting things about mistletoe uh, and we have we have two species, uh, endangered species, or sensitive wildlife species that sometimes like mistletoe or interact with mistletoe. And that's the you know the spotted owl in uh, Washington and Oregon, and the goshawk in many areas use these mistletoe uh, trees for perches, for nest building, that type of thing. So again. This is where, back to the interaction of the other disciplines, become uh, important with uh, our planning of fuel treatments and these disturbances, because sometimes the mistletoe becomes another factor in uh, developing a forest management treatment. The other critter that comes into it, and I'm using root disease as an example, but there's several types of diseases. And in chapter three, we actually create a table of all the diseases that we could identify that might have occurred in the dry mix conifer and which species are, are uh, prone to being affected by these. One of the interesting things about root disease as far as the fuel dynamics perspective is that it really doesn't grow out of this. You know, people say, well, you see some young trees, it's beginning to grow, but then those trees die. And so there's a continuous input of woody fuel. The other thing you want to notice is that in the forefront of this picture, there's some decadent shrubs sitting there. And that is all dead fuel. It's usually, you know, the less than three inches in diameter, usually in the one hour or 10 hour fuels. And it just sits there. And what do people say is, well, won't it decay? You know, it takes a long time for this stuff to actually decay at the base and drop off. Uh, what I've seen is that it lasts there for a very, very long time. The challenge we have as far as fuel treatments are concerned, uh, these tend to occur on shallow soils. They tend to occur at least in, so when I've seen very steep country too, because there's continuous mortality, we don't have a lot of product out there. And because it's steep, it's hard to put mechanical treatments. Plus, shrubs are difficult to burn. They have a very short uh, window in which they can actually, you know, that fire can actually deal with uh, changing this, and then they quickly re-sprout. So the longevity of these kind of systems are very, very difficult to, to treat, and they're always very much of a challenge. The only way we really can silviculturally is to, to convert it to a different, change the species composition, change it from to the more resistant ponderosa pine, western large white pine, uh, but then that takes major effort as far as site preparation, those kind of things. So. So it is a challenging area that actually contributes to the fuel dynamics of these forest types. The other one is weather. Now this is a hemlock type, but we actually have this a lot in the dry mix conifer forest. Uh, these are usually like windstorms. We had one in the late 90s in uh, part of the northern Rocky Mountains, took down a lot of trees, and then the beetles followed. Douglas fir. Douglas fir, and then the, the beetles followed up. Uh, with those, and so we had a major salvage effort that occurred. And what's interesting, and probably many of you in the audience recognize anecdotally, that we get these about every three to five years. 
we run three experimental forests between Russ and I, and we tend to get one of these storms about on average once every five years on one of those experimental forests. But interesting enough, we don't have zero information when I was looking for the synthesis to kind of get some idea of return interval, uh, the amount of fuels put in. We have like nothing out there. The best information I found was from a website that was focused in Seattle for the Seattle residents. It was a common knowledge type of focus that, that recorded the number of windstorms that came in and uh, over the last, you know, 50, 60 years. And there was over 60 different windstorms that were actually damaging windstorms. And so it does play a major element in these types, particularly depending on where you're at, uh, that are prone to wind or prone to ice breakage. The other thing that we often know about is insects. And, and probably I think of the dry mix conifer forest more of an opportunity in that they have more than one species. And so what might be an advantage to us from an insect fuels input is to promote a mixed species stand. You know, it's not always favorable to have ponderosa pine consistently across it or western larch. It may be very beneficial to have a mixture of these species, maybe not to the dominance, but to mitigate some of this insect infestation. And historically, it was much more in the endemic kind of category rather than in the epidemic category. One of the things about uh, when we talk about forest management, silviculture, and we'll talk about it more in, the, in uh, subsequent seminars that we're going to present, but heterogeneity is one of the things that uh, I think the mixed dry conifer forest has great potential, that nature abhors homogeneity whether it's a pure ponderosa pine stand, a pure lodgepole pine stand, a pure white pine stand. And when you have this uh, homogeneity, nature usually uh, does something with it with a fire, insects, or bugs. And so, like Terry says, we have probably, when we look at the mixed conifers, we have a lot of opportunities to change a species, change structures, change compositions, maybe make them more resilient to fire and fuel treatments, bugs, insects, and diseases. So you end up with a mosaic of compositions and structures. Yeah, and as this picture shows, yes, these are root rot centers, as you can see. But if you think about how they may have functioned endemically, they would have created a different forest structure and composition. And then combined with what we call the fire scenario, plus the wind, those other things, it really set up this particular forest type and the moist types as well, this kind of mosaic of different compositions and structures. So the question we have, now that we've kind of given this, do you integrate these other disturbances into your fuel planning? And the reason we want to know is so many times we do lack information about how these other disturbances play into fuel. And one of the things I think from a joint fire sciences perspective is to identify study areas or weak areas in, in fire and, and, and fuels and fuels management. And so this might give us an opportunity to say, do we want to uh, invest uh, more research, more knowledge in how these disturbances influence these mixed dry or mixed moist conifer for us? Would it be worthwhile? Those kind of things. And so part of the reason we wanted to ask this question was to kind of identify if there's a, a need to those. And one of the things about these disturbances, I think most of us know it intuitively anyway, is many times they work in concert with each other. Whether a root disease stresses a tree, makes it susceptible to bark beetles, or that we get a windstorm, like Terry said, and Douglas fir bark beetles come in after the windstorm, or we get a uh, a IPS epidemic and down slash that moves into green trees. And all of these maybe set up a lodgepole pine stand for a stand replacing fiery event because of all of these fuel loadings. Also, the other thing about these disturbances, how they interact back to the recency of a fuel treatment and how long a fuel treatment is going to last, all of these things interact in our decision over time and space. So again, as how do we integrate these other disturbances in there? Because like Forrest Gumper, Gump said when he was running down the street, you know, what happens? And sometimes it happens unexpectedly. 
And so again, how do we interact and put these together in our in our forest management field management planning becomes important. Well, our poll indicates that many of you, 77%, actually integrate the disturbance other than fire into the field planning. And and I guess for me, you know, I don't know if we can uh, ability to do this as we learn more about this webinar series. It'd be nice to know how you do that. Unfortunately, the polls don't allow us to write things in right now. But it would be interesting to know how you integrate those so that we can actually uh, identify places where maybe we need some research or maybe we're pretty good already and that we don't need to invest in much more concerning that area. So in summary, based on what our poll is, is that disturbance, I think in, in a lot of ways, disturbances do are multiple disturbances. And as Russ said, the interaction of disturbances is what makes these kind of uh, uh, mixed conifer kind of, uh, I think, in a little way, kind of somewhat unique. Maybe there, I'm sure we can find places where in the dry we have similar things. But I think a piece of that is that interaction of disturbance. And I think a lot of it is due to the species composition and uh, species composition, and the topographic variation. And depth of soils and soil depth. So there's a lot of things that might make these unique that might promote those kind of scenarios. Any questions? Yeah, there's some questions. I'm going to um, unmute George. George, you're unmuted now. You may ask your question. I think sometimes people accidentally hit their <laughs> raise hand button. Um, there was one other phone question from Diane. Let me see if I her she raised her hand earlier. I don't know if her question's related to this or all, but I see her hand is oh there it is. Oh, but she's not on the phone line, so I can't unmute her. Um, there are some other questions that came in earlier. Do you want to answer those, or do you want to move on? Uh, let's move on a little bit and finish the fire scenario. Why don't we do that, since we're falling a little behind? OK. But keep them, so that maybe we, it, we can ask them. And also, Mary, there's an, is there an opportunity we can address those after the fact? Oh, certainly. So let's talk about fire. And one of our questions was, well, how do we know what kind of fire regime we have? And as usual, we found out that it depends. And actually, there's a combination of both the low severity and the mixed severity fire regime. And, and we found that there is some indicators of what kind of forest you may have that may flip to a mixed severity or maintain more of a low severity. And of course, it'll vary depending on, on where you're at. And one of the uh, tables that we have in chapter three talking about fire regimes, we have the range of fire regimes that occur here. And I'm gonna continue talking a little bit while we go through this poll. But if you notice in that table, there was a wide range. And so in this poll, I have something called two to 86. That is not something made up. That really is a result of one of the studies. And there was another one of 2 to 80, 2 to 90. Uh, wide, wide breadth or range of fire return intervals. And so I think what's interesting about the dry mix conifer forest is that it's not just one of the things we might not want to do is focus on the average fire return interval, because it may be more important to recognize that the range is more critical. And what is the dominant range that occurred? Because I think that's what drove the mosaic as much as anything. It allowed for us to recover maybe even 50 years, 60 years, something like that before they were reburned again. And so I think not only are they diversity in species compositions, but I think they have a very strong diversity in uh, fire return interval. Hey, Mary, what are the results? The other thing when we talk about fire return intervals and the severity or the burn severity, I think in the mixed conifer forests, 
becomes extremely important. And this extreme importance comes to the burn severity of the soils and the response of the vegetation and the potential response we get to the vegetation. So the return interval is part of it, but also that burn severity, how deep that heating was on the four soils. And like I said earlier, all of the tremendous successional pathways and species complexes that we can result from a fire. And like Terry said, uh, these decadent shrubs sometimes produce enormous uh, fuels uh, that we don't have in other forest systems. So again, the uh, return interval, yes, is important, but also the return interval, the return interval, and the severity of that return. Well, uh, based on the poll. You know, there's many of us who believe that it's it's a fairly long, or there's a fairly wide range, but we're pretty much consistent across all of those. I mean, we kind of split fairly fairly equally. The key is that we do all seem to recognize that it's not as narrow as two to 20 years, even though some of the inferences of the literature we cited that fell into the mixed dry conifer forest was that narrow band. So can we use this to determine whether it is a mixed or low severity fire regime? And I have a hypothesis. And I don't know how many people agree with it, but I believe that that wider range in fire return interval may flavor a more mixed severity fire regime versus a more narrow fire return interval may be favoring a low severity fire regime. That the vegetation there would characterize more of that low severity. So possibly these fire return studies that are being done kind of give us a kind of an insight as to what kind of fire regime just by the width or the range of that interval. But are there other aspects that we should include to determine that? Well, there was a nice paper by Holofsky uh, came out in 2011 that conducted this in Northern California. And he identified, and his authors identified some key things. One, he noticed that in the mix, mixed, for it was topography, weather, structure, and composition. And in the Blue Mountains, uh, Dave Powell noted that they tend to have a low severity fire regime where the topography is not, not so diverse. It's more of a rolling topography, that kind of stuff. We tend to have low, but as the topography gets more complex, those kind of things, then we tend to fall into a mixed fire regime. So the complexity of the topography might be a key indicator. The other thing he, that Holofsky said was that the fuels are more of the driver in the low and that the other elements are more of the driver in the mix. As I said earlier, it might be the wide range in fire return intervals versus the narrow range in fire return intervals. And the other thing that Holofsky said is that there's a huge amount of edge effect uh, in, the mix, in the mixed conifer versus a low edge effect. In other words, if you look at a mixed conifer that has a lot of topographic diversity, we have a cedar inclusion and then we have a ponderosa pine. And so there's a lot of edges as you walk by. You change a lot of different forest types. You change a lot of topography. And so that, that really increases the number of edges. Versus if you're in the more of the low severity, you don't have a lot more edge. Like in the Boise Basin, in that first picture I showed you where we looked at some burning, that is very homogeneous. There's not a lot of edge effect. There's consistently ponderosa pine. So some of the things that might split a particular dry forest type between mixed or low is a function of these elements. And so for the person who asked the question earlier, are we in mixed or low, it really depends on where you're at, what is the topographic complexity, what are those other things that we can learn from the fire history studies that can give you an idea of whether you are in a low or mixed. And it's probably neither or. It's probably going to be a mixture of those or in combination depending on the aspect and slopes and, and that. So in that context, one of the things that I mentioned earlier is the role of shrubs. And in the more mixed fire regime, I think shrubs become even more critical. And so table 3.8 in this particular, in the book, is we focused on shrub tolerance. A lot of times in the fire literature, we focus on the tree. But I thought it was really important to add the shrub element because there's fire tolerance, there's the establishment, recovery time is critical. Some of the key shrubs recover within one year. When you start talking about fuel treatment longevity, uh, returning to do the maintenance, those kind of things, the shrubs are going to be a playing a major factor in, in those decisions. So one of the key things we added into that was this whole role of shrubs. And we focused on the key shrubs that occurred between the dry mixed conifer forest. 
So that kind of gives you an idea about, about the fire, about some of the disturbances in here. And this gives you another opportunity to maybe we can get, hit some of those questions uh, concerning the disturbance element, some of the fire, some of even, you know, as you build up the information we're providing, we're open to any questions right now. Mary, you can hit me up with those questions. Sure. Here's um, a comment. Um, there seems to be a huge bias against natural processes. For instance, why would you want to get rid of mistletoe? Mistletoe plays an important role in the forest beyond just uh, use by some birds mentioned. For one thing, it slows growth, thus creates snags that are lo longer lasting in the environment. Dead trees, particularly long lasting snags, are ecologically valuable. You know, you're exactly right. And one of the things that, you know, when, and, and maybe I was a little on the bias side when we were talking about those, they do play, play a huge role in a lot of the other attributes, these integrated scenarios. And one of the things that we found when we were doing interviews is that fuels is not necessarily the only driver. And we need to consider these other aspects. And I agree with uh, the, the person who asked the question, but also we need to find some balance. Uh, and, and I think that's probably the biggest challenge we have with trying to do integrated management is to find the balance where we can keep some of those elements, but not necessarily always keep all those elements. And the same thing from the fuels perspective or root disease. One of the key questions is root disease plays a role. It created particular forest structures that may have been very beneficial to wildlife. And some of those were endemic and here as long as the forest has been here. So a lot of the times when I get those questions or ideas, one of the things that the managers that you across the audience have to decide is what, to what extent do you want those elements? At, at what extent is it going to become something of a hazard from a spatial extent versus how is it going to play this role? And how do we intermingle these elements to create more of an integrated scenario for these fuels management? And so later on in the synthesis, we actually have a planning chapter that kind of tries to tie this all together and to kind of make you think about how you integrate these. Because you're right, these are playing a critical role in these forests as well, from a wildlife, from a structure, from a variety of other purposes. One thing I would add to Terry's discussion, she hit on the two key words to all these disturbances, endemic versus, versus epidemic. And at some point in time, all of these disturbances are as an endemic processes that worked in our forests. And even humans were very, we will get to it in a minute, were endemic processes that worked in many of our forests. So again, like Terry says, the balance of this, and I think that this integrated fuels treatments that many of us have struggled to develop becomes a very paramount. And the other thing about this is that forests are not static. And we need to realize that when we're treating for fuels, we're treating for timber, we're treating for wildlife, they are not static. And there's a lot of processes operating in them at various spatial scales and at various uh, temporal scales. So again, it, it's a fun process, but also it's a challenging process. And by, by looking at integration and through these processes, maybe we can come up with a better product. Mike, would you like to add anything? No, you guys are just doing great. <laughs> <laughs> there are a couple more comments. Okay. Uh, the, first, the first one is, we need to know more about the effects of a normal fire regime on mistletoe. Good point. <laughs> Can't agree more. And another comment. It's important to interpret ranges carefully, cautiously, when looking at skewed distributions, especially those describing fire return intervals, weebles, weebles shape and scale parameters are more informative than percentiles. That's a critical element. And, and you know, one of the things that you know, and I guess I'm going to put a challenge to the researchers out there doing fire histories that we need those kind of, that kind of information as uh, emphasized in some of these fire return intervals. Uh, 
you know, when I was looking through all the literature, and maybe Micah can chime in with me, I cannot recall if those distributions were presented in some of the literature that we read. Uh, but I think that's a good point. I think that uh, so many times we look at average fire returnable or the range, and, and it's really important how the distribution of those, how often one particular one occurred, were there, were there short ones that followed and then a long range, those kind of things. So no, I agree wholeheartedly. So Terry, this is Mike. Um, a lot of uh, fire history studies are now also reporting the Weibel mean or the Weibel distribution of, of fire return intervals. So. so Mike, how would you use that if you're a manager? Oh, um, geez. Good question, huh? Yeah, I mean, the thing is that we, these are fire return intervals for a natural wildfire situation, and we are not burning under natural weather conditions that a wildfire would occur when we do prescribed burns. So you have to take that into account. You're not going to get the same consumption and effect as if you were if, if you were to burn during uh, a normal fire year. So, you know, when we talk about frequency of fire, you also need to consider not just, you know, if the frequency was every 10 years or whatever, you don't want to burn every 10 years because you're not getting the same effect. So you might have to burn even more frequently to get the same effect. So there's frequency and then there's effect. And I don't know if there's a lot of feedback on my phone, so I apologize if people haven't heard. The other thing that I think is critical to recall is that the forests that occurred historically may not be present today. And, and part of that reason is the next section that we're going to introduce. And that has to deal with human impact. These forests, and, and a lot of the forests that we deal with, have had a major element of human impact. Starting way early on with Native, Native American burning, the, the Industrial Revolution and the introduction of the trains and the fact that people would, lots of fires would begin off of the railroads. Uh, the whole harvesting scenario, some of the root diseases that we have is not because they weren't, they are new, it's that because we don't have the species composition that we had when they were more endemic. Uh, mining, uh, it's amazing how much, if you look at the topographic breaks around, say, Idaho City, it isn't due to what was there before, it was due to the hydraulic mining that occurred. And you can see all this evidence of hydraulic mining. So the topography is very, very different than what might have occurred historically. Sheep grazing, fires themselves, the 1910 fire, a lot of the fires were began by the trains, by miners, by some of the logging because it was too dark and so they cut trees down. So there's, there's a whole lot of things that we as humans have done to alter what we see today. And so the big thing about including this was for us and the audience to start thinking about, well, how did those affect what we see today? How do they fit within the historical fire regime? How are we going to plan for the future? How are we going to integrate this? Because these things are here to stay in one way or form or another, even in through the collaboration and our own feelings about the forest and such. So, so human impacts is a critical element that we need to integrate into our thinking when we talk about dry mix conifer forests. One of the major impacts that I think most of us here on the phone and attending the seminar is the, the tremendous harvesting of ponderosa pine, western white pine, western larch that occurred uh, beginning heavily after World War II. Uh, 1945 through 1975, and some of us, I think, on the phone remember that uh, we were going to harvest all of our ponderosa pine, uh, western larch, western white pine, and then we were going to start using grand fir as the replacement for some of these early cereal species. And as we all know, the spruce budworm, the tussock moth, uh, the root diseases, really loved that change of switching from the early cereal species to the late cereals or mid cereal species. And the other thing was that Al Harvey, who worked with Terry and I for many years, always went through this, not only the changes of these species from early and mid cereal species to late cereal species, 
we started changing the whole nutrient dynamics uh, and this goes back into our, our fire return interval discussion. We changed the nutrient dynamics and also by switching to those, there was light seral species, we switched some of the fire return interval dynamics and also the impacts that those fires had. So again, like Terry said, we can't go back sometimes. We're going to have to deal with the deck of carns that we have out on the landscape and most importantly, this impact of humans that right now where Mike is there in Fort Collins on the front range of Colorado, uh, I think there's a home every, it used to be every, every mile on the front range, now it's down to like every quarter of a mile from the New Mexico to the Wyoming border. So humans are a much more present in these field treatments and the human expectations and the human impacts are going to be a major factor in our field treatment. And so, and I really don't under, know the answer to this. Do you think knowing past management actions will influence your field treatment management decisions in the future? Uh, I think that yes, I think it's a good answer, but how do we integrate that into our field management decisions or our integrated management decisions? I think that right now it's more than just fuels. It's as was pointed out by one of our people, one of the members of the audience, is, is there's a lot of other things that we value out there. And so how do we integrate that in? How do, you know, knowing the range or the weevil distribution of fire return interval, how do we use that and couple that with, with this human influence that is definitely going to be a part of the future of this forest? How do we integrate that? And, and so, you know, a large portion of this, this whole two, three chapters was to provide that information so that ultimately we come to this question and we take all the information that you just heard and have this discussion. How do we do this? How, what are the key elements that we think about when we're, when we're thinking about how to do that? A lot of times we say, well, let's return, let's reintroduce fire. But as Russ says, in some places it may be impossible to reintroduce fire. So what do we do in those situations? Those are some of the questions that came or evolved from, from really working on these chapters. The other question that came up to us is that, uh, that what do these forests look like? And we were unable to answer that specifically. What we did in those chapters was to provide the information so that people could sit around the table and have these type of discussions to come up with a vision of what they think these things are, what we can do, those kind of things. Uh, the result of our poll is that 78% of you incorporate past management actions and they do influence what your field treatment and management decisions are. I had zero people say that you do not, and, and the last remaining portion said maybe. So it's kind of, uh, I would love to have some discussions as to how you as, as an audience are integrating this thing into your thought processes. Uh, how do you apply those? What are you thinking of from that perspective? So I really am, uh, you guys can teach me some things about how, how you're doing that. So the end of this thing is that now we have kind of provided a whole series of information and there's a series of what I consider to be both challenges and opportunities. Some of those opportunities may be we have a lot of diversity out there and so that gives us a lot of options to go a variety of different directions to create or maintain some diversity out there. That gives us the opportunity to maintain pockets of of mistletoe or root disease pockets that may be a contribution to particular elements that we are trying to maintain. Uh, there may be areas where we have high priority places to do field treatments and other ones that we may not necessarily have to focus on. Uh, the hard part I think for me would be to understand what is the mosaic we want to create. What is the spatial extent we want these different fuel treatments to, to play? What is the, how is that going to fit into more of a landscape mosaic? How is it going to influence what happens site specifically? 
those kind of things. So I think the challenges are, are, are really how do we place that across the landscape? It's really a more of a landscape management strategy uh, when it comes to these. It's not just one size fits all and it varies. Um, any comments? Well, one okay. of the things that we, one of the things that we wanted to do with with these first opening chapters was to provide some context of the mixed dry conifer forest and how fuel treatments may be interacted them. And one of the one of the most interesting questions that we always have to ask as managers is, and this is from Barry Bolenbacher out of Region One Silvicultures, has used this term more than anybody or coined it that Terry and I've copped it from him. Why here and why now? And so these first opening chapters, hopefully when you get into your interdisciplinary teams and you're going to start and asking yourself, why here and why now? What is the rationale? What is the objective? Uh, these will give you some, this opening chapters will give you some context, some common ground to get into those discussions. So if we can give you anything to help with those discussions, that was sort of our purpose of these first few chapters, to give a common ground, a context for these why here, why now discussions. Well, we've come to the end of our seminar and we have about 10 minutes left. So this opens the door for a variety of comments, questions, uh, things I'd like to point out that Joint Fire Science Program provided the primary funding, but it, this is also funded because my salary and Mike's and, and others was covered by National Fire Plan, the Rocky Mountain Research Station. This whole interactive literature list was done by the publication staff uh, from the Rocky Mountain Research Station. I provided the idea, but they came up with a way to how to do it. And so I want to compliment them. They've done an exceptionally good job. And of course, the Northern Rockies Fire Science Network, who is the pre people that are producing this field since this uh, webinar series. So it doesn't take just one person, it takes many to get to this point. Mary. Yeah, and with, yes, we do have some comments, and I, we have a couple in the queue, and I encourage folks to submit more comments or raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question by phone. So here's a comment with um, somebody's commenting with a comment re to regard to the mistletoe question, and his comment was it depends on landowners' objectives. Um, so just keep that in mind. Another mistletoe question. Let's see. Oh, maybe that's not. Here we go. Here's another comment. Some of these disease populations may be outside of their historic range of variation due to influence of fire. For example, historic fire regimes may have kept dwarf mistletoe at lower levels. Fire may have kept true fur at lower levels and associated root disease, etc. It's difficult to know what is normal. That's very true. Uh, I was thinking about that, uh, in fact, last evening about these, this, these other disturbances and how whether they were there before or after, they probably were always there. But did we as humans perpetuate that from a harvesting perspective, or did we perpetuate it from a fire perspective? And probably it was a combination of both, I would think. One of the things that comes to my, my, my thoughts was when we started out this uh, an hour and a half ago, and we asked people whether they were seedlings, saplings, pole, or mature people, you got to remember that, remember that I, I use this, that a young forest is 90 years old. A old forest is, you know, 200 years old. A old age forest may be three to 400 years old. So when we, when we talk about some of these mixed conifer forests, dry mixed conifer forests, the breadth and age of the disturbances, the diseases that they have seen in sometimes uh, you know, two, three, four hundred years of exposure that uh, these forests have seen over the years. So what is normal? Uh, I, I think that is highly variable. And one of the disturbances we haven't mentioned yet that's still on a bug screen and none of us know how this is going to impact us is climate change. And climate change, uh, uh, silvicultures that I worked with and learned a lot from early in my career was Chuck Wellner. 
And Chuck Vonner always had the sentence that said, you silvicultures doing all this until you have a forest go through another 1933 drought. Uh, all of the treatments and all of our inferences that we put out are mute. And that was his suggestion that, uh, you know, 100 years to 150 years is the exposure that we need to even try to understand. And when we start talking about fire return intervals or mistletoe or these natural disturbances, it's a long-term process that we need to try to understand and integrate. Thanks for Harry, other um, comments? Some of the, thanks for addressing some of the climate change um, th the topic anyway. Somebody asked a question about that. So um, here's another question. Is there any data on the historical range of variability of high severity fire pack sizes in dry mixed conifer? There is one individual that probably comes closest to that, and that's Paul Hesburgh. And one of the things he's doing is looking at patch size distribution. And for those who are accustomed to silviculture lingo, the patch size distribution has a particular slope, and it's, it comes out to being a, a negative slope. In other words, there were more smaller patches distributed across this thing than large patches. So you could think of it as a reverse J curve. So that if you look at a graph, the, 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 the closest to the, the y-axis would be longer. And the, as you head out, it, the, the bars would become shorter. And that is called a 1.1 diameter distribution, or patch size distribution. It's what he's seeing in a lot of these landscape type of analysis to understand that patch size distribution. So, what he also said is that the patch, the disturbances and the patches kind of fed into each other, that, that a lot of more smaller patches maintained a smaller patch size because then the fire would burn into much more of a, a fine or more uh, fine-grained resolution, per se. But then once in a while, there would be this big blow-up like the 1910, and a, patch, a large patch size would occur. So he said, you know, my philosophy is that it's not just spatially diverse, but it's also temporally diverse. And so, you know, you could do many, many centuries with these, this mosaic of fine scale scenarios, and then we would have this larger fire that would create a, a more homogeneous patch. But even then, there would be diurnal changes in nighttime relative humidity, those kind of things. So there would probably be still some kind of mosaic that would continue to exist. And you can click on the interactive uh, Literature, literature, and you can get to Mr. Hesper. Any other comments? We do. We have a couple more. Just, just a comment on challenges relevant to achieving treatment objectives. Number one, agreeing to accept risks often results in co compromised ability to treat at meaningful scale. Two, compliance with air quality standards often result in lost opportunity to implement when trying to manage burning with a narrow restricted windows. Yeah, I can't agree more. And I think for the dry mix conifer forest, uh, yeah, particularly if they are dominated by steep topography, we can't use mechanical treatments on those unless, uh, unless some of these mechanical treatments can start working on steeper ground. So it is challenging. Uh, and and it takes quite a bit of time to, to implement those, and there's a certain amount of, of risk aversion towards that. One of the review, interviews we had was from an individual who said, well, there's the one every two, uh, one, you know, the kinds of prescribed fires that you can burn once every two years, and then there's those that you can only burn maybe once every five years. You know, the conditions are just right for, to, to putting off that fire, that kind of a prescribed fire. And so, yeah, it's, it's a challenging. And we need to kind of push uh, some knowledge back to those harvesting engineers, some of those people to push the technology so that maybe we can increase our mechanical abilities to treat some of these grounds if we are unable to burn. Our next comment is, um, has to do with applying considerations for applying fuel treatments. Overgrazing the loss of topsoil that resulted the lack of woody debris or the overabundance due to the absence of fire must be considered when applying fuel treatments. Yes. Yes. 
<laughs> it's I mean, unanimous. Yeah, it, that's a, that's a unanimous. That, that's a very good statement. And again, this is you know back to the human disturbance. And Terry had the picture of the sheep grazing. Remember our great plethora of regeneration in the dry ponderosa pine of the southwest. We attributed to that to the removing of the sheep in around the early turn of the century, 1900s. So yes, sheep grazing, cattle grazing, and even uh, large elk uh, and uh, deer populations can have major impacts. Well, I think we're at our 10.30 and I'm just kind of going to advertise this is the first of four series. The webinars are being recorded, so if you know of someone who wanted to listen in but just couldn't do it, you can direct them to those, and I think Mary will be able to let you know where that is. Uh, here are the dates for the next three webinar series concerning this particular field synthesis. The next one will be focused on prescribed fire. That's only one chapter. Wildlife, we'll be talking about wildlife elements. And then we'll finish with an economics. And the economics is really a true economic evaluation of the current conditions using forest inventory analysis data. And that will be led by Jeremy Free. As you notice on the book, I have three sections. The ecology, the planning and implementation, and the field tree feasibility and longevity. And I put this little goat in the middle of it. The reason I did that is that when we talk about managing the for us into the future, we need to really think outside the box and, and really start to pursue a variety of different methods and techniques to get the job done. Because I think that in the challenges also provide opportunities. And as the Nez Perce tribe does, they use goats to help sometimes manage their shrub dominance. And so one of the things that we did in this synthesis is provide a portal to this kind of information. There's actually a very good document, and we have a link to that in the document, that talks about using animals for fuels or for management. So there's a lot of things to think about when we're talking about these treatments or how we're going to manage these forests into the future.